Hello everyone and welcome to the latest installment of Real History. I am your host, Jared Frederick, and we're going to be taking a look at a newer film this evening, and that is Ridley Scott's 2021 medieval film entitled The Last Duel. I've really been looking forward to watching this one. This one will also be a genuine first time reaction. And uh, this is one that I had hoped to see in theaters, but the film in many ways fell into the, the cinematic void of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, so this will be my, my first time watching it on rental here in my home office. Uh, as we know from some of our more recent episodes, Ridley Scott is well known for his historical epics of Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, Kingdom of Heaven, and this fits within a long cinematic trend within his own career. But the question always remains, where does it stand in regard to the historical record? This is a film that is based off of a piece of historical nonfiction by an academic by the name of Eric Yeager. Uh, who wrote the book of the same title, and from what I understand, uh, Jaeger actually looked rather favorably uh, upon this film, so perhaps that is a good indicator of where some of the history within this film stands. Uh, I have done a lot of research on the background of this film. I am familiar with uh, the real history, uh, as is portrayed, but the question is, will the film remain truthful to the history? And so I suspect there will still be a degree of suspense upon my part. So let's go ahead and find out together and let's check out The Last Duel. So Paris, December 29th, 1386. This is the day of the duel itself, so we're starting off with a little bit of uh, forecasting of what lies ahead in the film's narrative, no doubt. On pain of death and the loss of property, for anyone here to be armed or to carry a sword or dagger. And it looks like we have King Charles VI sitting up here in the expensive seats. That would be my guess. And on foot, armed in the manner that pleases him with any weapon or device of attack and You know, as we're right out of the, the gate here, uh, I, I already gained a sense of some liberties that have been taken, and Matt Damon himself, who actually co-wrote the script for this film, uh, alluded to this in, in an interview that I saw. Uh, they really spiced up the look of the armor in these opening scenes. And I think uh, as to how Matt Damon likened it, he said, if we were to look as the real people looked, uh, it would have looked like two guys running around wearing tin cans. And so they obviously went for a more ornamental look, but something that was still nonetheless appropriate to the period. I, I like here from the outset that the movie is, is broken up into chapters. Here we see the, the truth according to Don Carroge, and that is Matt Damon's character. And uh, Carroge, uh, you know, the, the, whole, the whole premise of this film is based upon uh, Carroge's feud, and eventually the duel, um, between he and one of his comrades played by Adam Driver, whose name is Legree. And both of these men were, were lower-born individuals who have high ambitions to rise to the, the higher echelons of Norman society. And they both served as vassals for Count Pierre de Alacuan, who is portrayed by Ben Affleck. Uh, in this film. And so through, through war, through comradeship, through similar circumstances, they become good friends, almost like brothers, one of them later admitted. Uh, but that is all soon to fall apart and collapse as a bitter rivalry and sense of jealousy emerges between the two men. And that is ultimately what will set us on a collision course here. 
John, we were ordered by Pierre to hold this bridge. Orders be damned. For the king. For the king! Oh. Wow. Talk about scope. The, the Battle of Limoges, which took place on September 19, 1370, was a real-life battle. And uh, that happened during what was known as the, the Caroline Phase of the Hundred Years' War. And uh, this phase of that conflict lasted uh, late 1360s to late 1380s. And uh, as the historical record would, would indicate, there were a number of civilians killed here. I guess the true historical question is exactly how many civilians were killed. Um, but here at, at the outset of this bit of combat, you know, we see townspeople with their throats being slit by the river. We see their town uh, burning here in, in the background. And uh, shortly thereafter, we, we hear... Um, Jean talking about uh, the, the port at Brest being lost uh, as well. Um, and so, you know, this dialogue is grounded in some fairly accurate historical understanding. So, not too bad so far. Declare yourself! Squire Jean de Carouge, son of the captain of this fort. Wow, so seven years have passed. Uh, we find ourselves at, at Fort Bellame. Uh, which is the, the keepsake of the de Carriger family. And uh, I read that they actually filmed this at a, a historical landmark that I believe is open to the public called the Chateau de Fenelon, uh, which I found out was also used as the setting for the fairy tale film Ever After. Um, so this is a very, very different film, as you can well imagine. You know, something else that I get a sense of here from the, the settings, uh, the material culture, the, the props, the backdrops, um, it's very much in the creative fabric. It, it, it's very aesthetically similar to Ridley Scott's Gladiator in my mind. Uh, you know, there's a lot of colorful clothing that was worn during this era. Uh, think uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, I mean, you know, this one, it's, it's dark, it's gritty, it's grimy, and that is a thematic device that is used to help set the scene for the rather presumably dark proceedings of the film. I don't have it. This plague has carried off half my workforce. My rent collection is down. My field yield half what they used and to. And the cost of labor is now horse. risen. Talk about a, a, a lack of capital, a lack of agency. Uh, de Carriger talks about the plague, you know, wiping out his, his labor force. Now, this film is set 30 years after the plague, known as the Black Death, and the plague killed perhaps 100 million people, possibly even more, so many that we don't even have a firm accounting. So you may be wondering, if this is 30 years later, how could there still be a labor shortage? But 100 million people is a lot of people. And, you know, labor markets, uh, military, uh, matters of commerce, everything was backlogged. People were still recovering from this huge biological shock of decades earlier. And so it perhaps shouldn't be surprising that, you know, issues of the plague and the conversation of that coming up here uh, is something that is dramatically affect, uh, affecting the characters. And uh, interestingly enough, too, uh, uh, the halting, or this film was halted, uh, the, the shooting of it uh, was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, a whole other plague that the cast and crew had to confront as they were talking about another plague of many centuries ago. Oh, wow, we find ourselves in Normandy now. Wow, so we're already 10 years into this story. This is moving quickly. Oh. 
You know, I, I've been to Normandy on uh, a couple of occasions, and you know, I primarily look at World War II history while I'm there. Uh, but you, when you look at these these buildings that are hundreds of years old, uh, castles and chateaus with with moats, um, you really get a sense of the deeply uh, rooted history going all the way back to, to this time in, in the 14th century. You know, while we're in the year 1380 here, it's, it's worth mentioning this is the same year that Charles V passes away. And, you know, prior to that, there had been a French military revival of, of sorts uh, that was underway. Yet, you know, kind of both sides, you know, the British and the French, they were really running out of steam. And, you know, battle scenes like this, it's certainly understandable why. Everybody was becoming uh, rather war-weary. Some lessons are learned later in life. Hmm? Allow me to introduce my daughter, Marguerite. Ah, so here we are, introduced to, to Marguerite, the, the, the center of this drama and controversy. Uh, so we've also been introduced to her uh, father, uh, Robert de Thibbleville, um, who was a Norman lord who had uh, a bad reputation of siding against the French king in these various uh, territorial conflicts uh, that had been uh, occurring to this time. And you know, it's amazing the guy lived uh, as long as he did, uh, considering you know, the, the rather volatile circumstances that he went to. Um, and so uh, this matchmaking that he's doing between his daughter Marguerite and de Carage, uh, he was undoubtedly hoping to revive some of the luster of, of his family in the process. Oh, it's, it's interesting how we're seeing uh, the, the kisses here at the wedding being passed from, from person to person, spreading the love, uh, I, I suppose, here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm surprised something that, that's not shown, though. I mean, you know, the, the authenticity uh, in this movie so far, I think, has been, you know, quite good. Um, but, you know, one of the common facets of a wedding during this time period um, was the blessing of 13 coins, which uh, represented the, the dowry that was often associated uh, with these arranged betrothals. Um, and so, uh, we, we then see, um, you know, some partying happening here. And these parties could go on for, for days at a time. You think weddings get out of hand now. You should travel back a few hundred years and see this. Um, but going back to the dowries, dowries usually came about in the form of land. Land was everything. Um, and so, this is where the the land that perhaps the 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 woman of the marriage owned you know would be handed off to her groom or the groom's father because we lived in a very patriarchal time here oh that's cool that's really cool to see notre dame <laughs> lingering there in the background um yeah, you know, construction of, of Notre Dame Cathedral, which which I've had the blessing of being able to see, unfortunately, shortly after it it caught on fire in the spring of 2019, the construction of that actually began in the 1160s, and you know it had been open close to a half a century by the time of this film setting, but um, I don't know if there was, still would have been like scaffolding up against it like we we see here, but. I guess suffice it to say, it was still a masterpiece in progress. Who then will assume my father's captaincy? It's, it's interesting to, to note, you know, these conversations on the notions of, of captaincy. Uh, because, yeah, do they mean Castellan? Um, I'm wondering if, if they changed the wording here just so the audiences would be aware of, you know, what's actually being discussed. But, you know, in any case, uh, 
A castellan was a governor of a castle or a region um, that, that surrounded it, of course. Um, and, you know, that region would have been known as a castellancy. Um, so I'm wondering if they're using the synonym of captaincy for castellancy, um, just to make it a little bit smoother for audiences. Um, or maybe I'm just, you know, misunderstanding it. Um, but the notion of a castellancy or a captaincy, whichever you prefer, uh, I think is a, a vital component for understanding the motives of the characters herein. All right, so we're in 1381 now. So, man, 11 years since the movie started. That's a lot of territory that's being covered here. No one's aging either. People aged a lot back then, too. Um, so, also in, in 1381, there was a peasants' revolt uh, that was happening just right across the English Channel. And, you know, these folks were were trying to abolish serfdom. They were trying to gain a more egalitarian standing. You know, rents that weren't as draconian and harsh. A better pay, you know, perhaps a degree of land ownership for themselves. And undoubtedly, these issues happening a relatively short distance across the English Channel would have been very much on the mind for, you know, these aspiring nobles. Um, so, something interesting to keep in mind in regard to the broader historical context. Oh, Jesus. Oh, 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 God. Yes, arrows could be a very, very lethal force in this regard. You know, um, archery, you know, arrows and whatnot um, of the time, you know, effective range might be 200 yards, 300 yards at most. Um, and as is the case with many weapons, you know, the closer, the better. Uh, and so a lot of this violence, okay, it, I, I think it said was, was unfolding in, in 1385. And, um, and so by that point, uh, King Richard has led his army into Scotland. They want to kick out the French. And uh, the, the French have been occupying parts of that country for, um, you know, a year or two, maybe three years. Uh, by that point. So there's just this, this, this epic seesaw of violence uh, that is uh, perpetually unfolding and it looks like uh, uh, Jean here is constantly being pulled into it and uh, yeah, he, he does look a little bit older and haggard here by this point so I, I take that back from earlier. Uh, he attacked me. He pinned me down. I protested. I screamed. I cried out as best I could but there was no one here. So here we are, the report of Marguerite's rape. This is the root of the tension throughout the, the rest of the story. And I'll be really interested to see how this is portrayed in subsequent chapters, presumably through the eyes of, of other characters. Um, but, you know, the question here is, is rape common uh, during this time period? And unfortunately so. Um, you know, the very misogynist society that was the 14th uh, century, you know, the sad truth of the matter is, is that most women who were victims of rape really had no legal recourse. You know, there was no viable option for them to seek justice in, in the broad scheme of things. Um, and, you know, and I'll be interested to see what direction this film takes it, but, you know, when rape was committed, it was seen as less of a, a violation of a, a woman's body and a woman's rights, um, but it more so came down to an issue of property um, in regard to her husband. You know, would her husband seek satisfaction for the wrong that was committed against his human property that was his wife. That may sound very you know, harsh and draconian, but this was not an easy world or a very just world in which these people lived. Marguerite is my wife, and she has been wronged. I will not allow this to go unpunished. Your only avenue is through Pierre. And you know, some of this stuff was just really messed up back in the day because, um, 
you know, sometimes a rapist could 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 get away with it if he married the woman, uh, you know, agreed to take care of her, like really, you know, weird stuff like that. Um, sometimes, you know, if, if a person raped a married woman, you'd have to pay a fine to her husband. Um, and so, you know, rather twisted senses and uh, notions of justice by our standards today. That remains acceptable as a venue. It would require a full convening of the assembled parliamentary body of Paris, all 32 members of Your Majesty's Court. Okay, so here we're introduced to King Charles VI. Uh, a little bit further, who had some own some uh, personal problems on his own, um, you know. But I I'm gonna pause the movie here because um, I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper as we're getting to this idea of judicial dueling, and I found a really good article by legal historian Ariella Alema, um, and a lot of her research focuses on these ideas of trial by combat in France and England um, during this time period. And I think it, it's worthwhile to, to see what some historians have to say um, on these matters before I go a little bit further uh, with the film. Um, and she says, Judicial duels were most common in cases where the evidence was really unclear and it was difficult to solve the matter by any other means. Um, and so, you know, clashes like this apparently had become really, really rare by the time we get to the late 14th century when this film is set. And so, you know, lawyers of the time were using kind of uh, uh, the, the prospects um, of a duel, you know, the threat of a duel, hoping that they could settle a, a case uh, through less violent means. Um, apparently, though, this is uh, going to be the, the exception to that pattern of the time. Um, and so, you know, apparently of all of these doles, though, very few people were killed. You know, it's kind of like doles of later on, I suppose, when people are taking, you know, 10 steps apart with flintlock pistols, hoping that a compromise or some sort of litigation could be reached before people were actually killed. I don't think that's the route that this movie's going to go, though. His Majesty, King Charles the this takes us to this this grand building known as the the Palace of Justice, and there's a version of, of this palace that that still stands in 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 Paris today, the kind of the main judicial center of uh, the French capital here. And I believe the building that is depicted in this movie it was used up well past the time period of of the French Revolution, used well into uh, uh, the 1800s. Um, and, uh, you know, going from my own experience of, of walking around in French cities, big and small, uh, I love that their buildings have long shelf lives. We should try that here more so in the United States. Uh, so here we go. The, the truth according to Legree. Okay, so we're going all the way back to Limoges now. You know, I really like these alternative uh, points of view. I mean, this is what history is all about. It's about you know, uh, cross-analyzing and cross-referencing, you know, what are people saying? Do, you know, all of their words, you know, and, and experiences jive together? Um, this is the sort of detective work that historians do, or at least they should do. Journalists and, you know, and reporters and stuff, you know, uh, do the, these sorts of things as well. And, you know, as I get further into this film, oh, oh, that was bad. Um, <laughs> This movie would be really good to show students at the college level, I think, um, because it shows the sort of investigative inquiry that is necessary for historians. You have to take evidence. It doesn't always jive. It doesn't always go together. You have to cross-analyze, and you have to draw an interpretation from it. And uh, I'm really liking this movie as a result of that. Thank you, my lord. Yes. The great, the gold, or the sandal? This is a very sort of different characterization for uh, Ben Affleck, but I kind of like it, you know, kind of this, this foppish count, you know, who's uh, walking around in, in gold slippers. Goodness stays between us, of course. 
My accounts are in disarray. Would you mind bringing your expertise to bear on my finances? <laughs> it seems like everybody's in such rough financial shape. Uh, everyone's uh, bickering over land that they want. Uh, these alliances that they're going to form. Um, it's very calculative. It's, it's incestuous to a degree. Um, and in all these regards, the film is highly accurate. <laughs> Nothing like a good old-fashioned elk hunt with the hounds. Man, a lot of hounds, too. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, and it's important to differentiate the, the styles and manners of hunting here during this time period. Um, because, you know, these guys aren't hunting because they require the sustenance from this elk. Yeah, they, they'll probably eat the elk, most definitely. Um, but they're doing it for the sport, the camaraderie. Um, and, you know, as we see here between Pierre and Legree, uh, these sorts of hunts with, you know, the, these gentlemen barons and landowners and entrepreneurs and whatnot, uh, they were also fitting occasions to discuss politics, alliances, um, and it was a good venue to make these sort of backroom deals as well. So, I like what I see here. He's suing me. Oh, come in, take your pants off. And of course, what's a, what's a good medieval party without an orgy at the end of it? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I know all about your squire. The squire you gifted the land to. The one who holds a captaincy now that is rightfully mine. Oh, and here we see Jean taking his uh, his grievances forward, and and th and this is, you know, as best as I can tell, um, so many of these conversations and these dynamics are based upon the subsequent testimony that later emerges in, you know, the the, the trial against Legree, and you know, you know, all these people would have been speaking French. I'm really glad the actors didn't choose to speak in French accents because I really think it would have hindered their ability to deliver some of these lines with the potency like we see here in this verbal showdown between uh, Jean and Pierre and Legree. Um, wow, that was, some, that was some damn fine acting by Matt Damon. Give my old friend a kiss. Show him the good faith of the house Carouge. Oh, that... <laughs> the kiss here was... Uh, was was shot differently. It was closer. It seemed a little bit more sensual, a, a little bit more um, intimate, uh, rather than just a kind of casual, hey, you know, I'm here, welcome me sort of kiss. Uh, so I, I like the different sort of uh, angles and perspectives being taken here. Smart woman. Zagmir? There is naive undum. You know, this idea of, of people speaking all sorts of different languages, you know, you may be wondering, like, how in the world did, did people know how to speak multiple languages? I mean, you know, most people never left a, a few miles beyond their front doors, or, or so it would seem to us in hindsight. But you have to remember, you know, throughout the Middle Ages, you know, people could move pretty extensively. If you think about the Crusades, if you think about these various religious wars and expeditions, if you think about religious pilgrimages, which were the predecessor to the modern-day vacation, uh, you know, taken on the name of uh, spiritual motives, you know, this idea of being multilingual, it's not as far-fetched as what you may think. Um, and I also think you know, I, I'm already getting the sense here that Marguerite's character, you know, she's going to take on the role of an empowered female figure. Uh, and the fact that she is multilingual, I think, is going to underscore that here as, as the movie goes along. Don't do it. Bad things are going to happen. For your own safety. If your husband hears of this, 
He may kill you. Oh, this is horrible. When you put Adam Driver in a black suit, bad things happen. I have committed the sin of adultery against a man I once considered a friend. Uh, it's very revealing here that Legree is confessing his sin, not of raping a woman, but of committing adultery, making a transgression against a fellow man, not against a woman. That's kind of how he's presenting it here to uh, the priest. Um, and you know, the, the, the punishment for adultery was, was very lopsided here, you know, back in the day. Um, women could uh, be whipped, beaten, have their heads shaven, etc., etc., etc. And, you know, it, suffice it to say, the, the penalties against men were, were not as harsh. Uh, and, you know, all the while, uh, the church encouraged... Well, that's sexual repression. Uh, you know, uh, you know, resist your desires and and whatnot. And uh, it it didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. Of course, she made the customary protest, but she is a lady. It it was not against her will. And you know, Count Pierre being buddy buddy with Legree as well as the king, of course. Uh, made him throw out the case uh, against Legree after Marguerite came forth, and this is historical fact. We knew it was wrong. I confessed my adultery and performed my penance. But I swear to you, this charge of rape is false. Something I forgot to mention earlier, too, uh, is that uh, Legree's words to Marguerite after he rapes her, you know, keep, your qu keep quiet or your husband may kill you, that, from what I recall, was taken directly from the court transcripts as, as Marguerite recalled it. And of course now we get to the truth of Marguerite here in this, uh, in this next chapter. I'm going to be really, really interested to see how, how this plays out from, from her perspective. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> Jeez! Oh, my, my! No animals were harmed in the making of this film, hopefully. I trust your little death was a memorable and productive one. It was like none other. And I, I don't see it as any coincidence that uh, we, we have two scenes here back to back showing the mating of horses and then the mating of humans and I have no doubt that what director Ridley Scott is trying to convey is that Matt Damon's character is treating his wife just like his horses she's a piece of flesh just like his mares and his stallions and he's just trying to get uh, offspring that will be most lucrative to him and uh, and they're they're getting into these conversations now about the importance of conceiving a son as well. And of course, if you look back at any you know aspect of medieval history, the the importance of producing a male heir to maintain that system of patriarchy was all important. Good morning to you, my lady. <sighs> Pregnancy seems to be going well. Yes, my lady. And. You know, seeing these scenes of Marguerite going about the estate, you know, telling people in the stables how they should be taking care of the horses, telling the farmers how they should be tending to the crops, how they should be plowing the fields. Uh, this may seem like a theatrical liberty, but, you know, in the Middle Ages, it is not entirely unusual for women of middle class standing and even upper class standing to... Uh, assume these duties or run the the family businesses in the absence of uh, of their husband and uh, sometimes they were better at it than what uh, you know their their male spouses were um, and so you know I don't think this is beyond the realm of exaggeration at all my lady it appears you are suffering from an imbalance of the four humors the primarily black bile the imbalance of the four humors, God forbid. 
so the the four humors, you know, you know, back in the day, and this was a, a practice that was subscribed to even here in the United States up through the the early and mid nineteen or eighteen hundreds. Um, is that there was this belief that there was a balance of good blood and bad blood. And if you had too much bad blood, often the remedy for that would be a physician would bleed you. You know, get out a nice little scalpel, find a nice little vein or artery there and, you know, let the blood flow out. And of course, that's not the way to do things, uh, as we can see with the power of hindsight. Um, but, you know, the, the idea of the four humors, you know, there was blood, phlegm, uh, yellow bile, and black bile. Those, those were the four humors. Um, and, you know, and they said that, you know, a balance or imbalance of these things, it could give you a certain persona. It could, you know, uh, lead you to, to have some sort of... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, mood swings, you know, if you if you had uh, an imbalance, it could change your complexion. Um, and so, you know, this was a very sort of quasi-scientific understanding of how how blood works and uh, how our, our, our systems work. Uh, so, yeah, a, a harsh learning curve here, shall we say, with middle-age medicine. <laughs> Oh, this is so horrible and you notice how it is filmed differently you know it it it, it it's it's up close there's no way to escape the horror on her face it, it's it's rougher it's more violent than what the previous iteration was and of course for victims who who suffer this sort of sexual assault quite naturally it is a harsher memory for them than what it is for the perpetrator and so for as despicable as what we see happening here it's it's rather uh prominent filmmaking on the part of ridley scott it is because he's he's differentiating the experience for the benefit of of the audience um and so it's it, it's very ably filmed here for as, for as horrible as it is. He raped me. Are you telling me the truth? Please. Are you telling me the truth? Uh, here too, another difference. We see a far less sympathetic Matt Damon. You did not provoke this question mark. Jeez. Can this man... Do nothing but evil to me! Can this man do nothing but evil to me? Oh man, it's all about him. Oh jeez. Yeah. She remembers this in a very different way than what he does, that's for sure. Sean, I intend to speak the truth. I will not be silent. I will not be silent. That is a great line. Uh, and, you know, as, as I always say, with almost all of the films that we take a look at here on, on Real History, all movies are products of their time, and I definitely see this as a cultural product of the Me Too era. Uh, you know, uh, women speaking out, uh, you know, some believing they're speaking out of turn, uh, but they will not be silent any longer, and they are defying authority in the process. They are challenging men who are in power and so you know there are shades of past and present uh, that emerge here and I my guess is that this is going to become a a big theme of the movie here uh, going forward your only avenue is through Pierre now I doubt he will give you a hearing tell the story you heard today and you know from what I recall from Jaeger's book uh, you know is um, well, the movie, much like the book, you know, uh, neither Legree or Carouge, and I think I was pronouncing that wrong earlier, so I apologize. Yeah, pronunciations are so hard, historically speaking. You all always call me out on that, so thank you, you know. Um, but in any case, um, neither of these men come off looking very good. Uh, 
and what I predict is that Marguerite's gonna come out swinging here and, you know, emerging as, as the hero. We'll see. I am telling the truth. The truth does not matter. Mm. <laughs> the truth does not matter. Oh yeah, I think this is uh, ringing to some contemporary issues as well. Alternative facts, anyone? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this comes down to the idea that this is a story of alternative truths, you know? Everybody in this film has their own truths, but there can only be one set of facts. And so we'll see if the facts come to the surface here as the, as the plot evolves further. Man, this is, this is good stuff. I've heard from several sources that you told others you found Monsieur Legree handsome. And, you know, the question here emerges in, uh, as, as, the, as the trial, as the inquiry is underway here in uh, the Palace of Justice. Um, you know, who, who are we to believe? I think that, that is still open to question here, perhaps in the minds of, uh, of the audience. But, you know, uh, Jaeger came to the conclusion that he never would have written this book if he didn't believe Marguerite. Uh, there is no way that he was going to tell that story if he did not believe the woman who uh, went through these horrific circumstances. And so I, I think it's helpful to at least think of it from his perspective uh, to an extent. If your husband were to lose the jewel, it would demonstrate God's judgment and reveal you for having borne false witness. Man, th this is so warped. These, these notions of justice, punishment, justice, uh, you know, and on all these, you know, quack scientific theories that, you know, uh, a woman couldn't get pregnant if she wasn't enjoying, you know, intercourse. Uh, the idea of bearing, you know, false witness, you know, um, the idea that, you know, the woman was guilty of her husband, you know, loses in the forthcoming dole. Um, yeah, I mean, separation of church and state, anyone? You know, you kind of get a sense why America's founding fathers, you know, look back on uh, history of centuries past. And, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> need we say any more? We will proceed with the jewel. You know, on, the, on this note of the judicial duel, uh, I think Jaeger says something that, that's very helpful here. And he says, The ferocious logic of the duel implied that proof was already latent in the bodies of the two combatants, and that the duel's divinely assured outcome would reveal which man had sworn falsely and which had told the truth. <laughs> it's so messed up. <laughs> you think Lugri Hansen, do you? You have disgraced me before my king and all of France. You knew what would happen to me should you lose this duel. As we see Carouge and Marguerite here argue in, uh, in this passageway, this courtyard setting, with everybody watching, um, you know, the, 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 these ideas of pride and vanity are at the root of this movie. Now, they're, they're at the root of the film's moral compass. And, you know, and when a movie, when a historical movie is well done, it should make us think about our own times, it should make us think about our own lives, it should make us think about our own moral philosophies, and uh, this movie's batting a hundred as far as I'm concerned in this regard. All the preparations are made. I'm ready. And, of course, as the historical record would suggest, uh, Marguerite did bear a child here in the interim, and, you know, the big question is, who's the dad? In the long run here, as we're getting into these philosophical consequences and conversations, rather, we shouldn't have to live in a world where there are consequences for telling the truth. And I think here too is another issue that gets to the, the heart of the matter here in this film. Lady, upon your evidence, 
I hazard my life in combat with Jacques Legree. You know my cause is just and true. These public pronouncements as the dole is about to get underway. Uh, you know, these two are based in the historical record. I mean, there are a lot of witnesses to all this, as, as these scenes would indicate. Marguerite was standing there. She was watching it. She was wearing black. Her husband calls out to her, essentially saying, you know, you know, I have your blessing. You know, God is on our side uh, and whatnot. Um, and, and meanwhile, too, we see uh, King Charles the Sixth up here like a, a giddy school kid, uh, you know, uh, hinting at, at some of his... Uh, psychological problems, some of his uh, fits of anger and rage that really inhibited uh, aspects of his reign. Um, we only kind of get a hint of that, though, in the movie. Maybe, maybe we should have gone more the Commodus route out of uh, Gladiator. Let us pray this ends like the Duel of Flanders. Oh, and here we get started, going back to the beginning. Let them go! Let okay, so we are now caught up in the present. Oh man, the, the speed of this is intense. And the, the, man, the cinematography, it's stark, it's beautiful. You know, I'm, I'm rooting for Carouge, not because I like him, but because I'm rooting for his wife. Oh man, this is this is so brilliantly filmed. You really get a sense of where those gladiator vibes are are coming into play here. But you know, at the same time, I you know, perhaps it's not embellished to quite the extent. I'm gonna look into that though here before I'm done watching. Oh, oh man, he's gonna bleed out. Oh, <laughs> it's like it's like the end of the Patriot. You think he's down and out, but he still has some fight left in him. Oh, he's got him now. Is he gonna do it? Invest in me. Proves there was no rape. <laughs> Denying it to the very end. <laughs> Which I believe he he said, you know, he, he he tried to maintain his innocence to the very end. In the name of God, and on the peril of damnation of my soul, <laughs> I am innocent of the crime. Oh, I don't think that's gonna help him. <laughs> oh my God. As far as I understand, the, the the husband and wife did embrace after the dole had concluded. Oh, and here he, using her as a showpiece once again. And, uh, you know, evidence would... You know, <laughs> are you not entertained? Here we are. Uh, and the evidence would suggest that... Uh, Carouge's uh, standing in both regard to his his uh, his celebrity, uh, his, his his personality, his, probably his his purse as well, uh, were greatly enhanced as a, as a result of uh, the aftermath of all of this. Oh, and you know, here we see, you know, Legree's body, you know, being 
sent off to the the gallows, the pillory, what have you. And uh, you know this this was you know in in sync with the the traditions of the time. You know this is where rapists, killers, thieves their their bodies were were put on display. You know as a as a final insult to their tarnished reputations um, and the evidence suggests this is exactly what what happened to Legree and here at the end we 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 have the sun that everybody wanted to begin with and she's probably sitting here wondering what sort of Man, will this boy become? Uh, she ended up running the show after all. Bravo. Bravo. That was a really good film. And you know, I get a sense that it really stayed true to the, the source material upon which uh, you know, it was based. Now, you know, the the name of the title of The Last Dole, uh, both the, the book and the film, but, you know, it's it's a little bit of a, a misnomer. I mean, doles continued for hundreds of years after the, the Carouge uh, Legree dole, uh, but it was the last one sanctioned by the Parliament of Paris, and so, you know, the, the, there could be an, an asterisk, you know, <laughs> after, uh, after the, the name of the title here. Uh, but, you know, it, it brings us to all sorts of interesting contemporary conversations about truth, finding out fact, uh, you know, uh, the whole investigative process, you know, we can think of this in in modern terms in regard to the work that we historians do, you know, how do we how do we verify a narrative? How do we prove something that actually happened? You know, we historians, we work in the same way as, you know, trial lawyers do uh, when when you think about it. Um, and then there's the, the whole points about about equity, listening to victims, uh, themes of female empowerment, fighting oppression, um, and we've certainly come a long, long way in the several hundred years since this, this film was set. But, you know, this film, I think, in so many ways is, is a corollary to conversations that, that we're having in the 21st century. And that is what good historical films do. Uh, and so, all in all, I'm, I'm really pleased with this movie. I, I think it is... Uh, uh, far more accurate than other Ridley Scott films uh, like Gladiator or Kingdom of Heaven and you know it's more equivalent to uh, Black Hawk Down another Ridley Scott film uh, which is uh, likewise uh, quite accurate all things considered um, and on, on a cinematic level you know it, it likewise is a throwback to these big screen Hollywood blockbusters of the 1950s and the 1960s that Ridley Scott, Ridley Scott uh, grew up on and has a lot of uh, affinity for and in particular it reminds me of the uh, Akira Kurosawa film Rashomon uh, which likewise is a film that is uh, broken up into uh, chapters that offer slightly differing perspectives of the same events and so uh, you know I, I can't help but think that that, that Ridley Scott took a, a degree of inspiration from uh, that that level of cinema as well so here we are at the end of another episode I'm uh, I'm continuously interested in in the projects of, of Ridley Scott he's a, an incredibly talented filmmaker um, the historical accuracy of his films is, is kind of a mixed bag, uh, but I'm I'm looking forward to his forthcoming biopic of Napoleon, which will be starring Joaquin Phoenix. And uh, rest assured, when that movie comes out, I can guarantee you that we'll be taking a look at that here on Real History as well. 
But in the interim, we have many more episodes and many more movies to analyze. As always, we thank you for tuning in. And once more, we if you enjoy this channel, we ask your support. We ask that you check out our store, perhaps buy a, a nice classy history t-shirt. And as we said before as well, we have a forthcoming website in the works that will have all sorts of great supplemental material as far as education and classroom use go. So please stay tuned. We have a lot of exciting things here in the works on Real History. We'll see you next time.